So I'm going to start uh, talking today about um, why we care about graph theory in computational biology is probably the starting point of all this. And I'm really starting from the, I want to say, the 347-mile view, view because um, I think our field is evolving in a way that has most recently happened to the field of astronomy. I think that's a perfect illustration of what's going on. And you know, astronomy in the last 100 years or so has really undergone a sea change that I would call a bit of an evolution because it's a response to the ch a change in the environment that's improving, well, maybe not survival, but survival of researchers, certainly, um, and survival of, of advances. And the idea is that in the last 100 years or so, their ability to, dis to get new data of a kind that we've just never seen before, you know, we can put a satellite <laughs> with a telescope on it 347 miles up there. And we can get a perspective on things that we've never had. Um, and that's led to a sea change. And I think the same kind of thing is happening much more recently now in biology with the advent of things like PCR and se sequencer, you know, next generation sequencing. All of a sudden, this field is really transformed. And so we can start to talk about things in a very different way. Um, we can start to do biology in a very different way. <laughs> right? We now can look, we, we get lots more data as the whole world is getting, and now we can start to look at things as whole systems, kind of holistically, and talk about how different parts of them work together and relate to each other in different ways. Um, <laughs> you know, so this thing is from a group in the UK, so it doesn't, it's not surprisingly looks like a London subway map, but it's actually a metabolic pathway map, right? And somebody drew this thing <laughs> to sort of give you a whole sense of, hey, this is a whole system working together, and we can look at how the pieces of it function. We get proteins that work as parts of subunits of molecular machines, really. A whole bunch of them work together to do a process, and so we can start to look at these questions about how do they work, um, and how do we understand them. So what I'm actually going to do today is, at least in this first talk, is start out by just talking about some, you know, basics. Really, um, I want to focus. I, I love what Ron said earlier in the week about representation because I think that is such a crucial issue to the use of networks in biology. And I think we're not thinking about it enough. So I want to talk a little about that. Um, and then I will talk about network or graph properties. Mostly with an idea, people here know graph theory. Mostly what I'm going to talk about is network properties that we might care about and what they have to say about biology. Right, so what can we learn about biology from looking at things as graphs and networks? Um, and then I'm going to talk a little about random graph models. You know, and again, looking primarily at what can they teach us about biology. Um, so <laughs> hopefully that will be at the right level. So the first question is, OK, we like to talk about Systems, and there are a lot of ways of talking about systems, right? We could draw us little London subway maps about everything. We could make pictures like this. So why do we talk about systems so often in terms of graph theory? Um, and I'm going to draw pictures today mostly of undirected graphs. Um, there are directed versions. Some, in some cases, we care about direction, mostly about when we're representing things like information flow. Um, in some cases, we will have weighted edges. But mostly, I'm going to draw undirected graphs unless we specifically talk about other things. Right, and when we do this in biology, we get vertices that represent a range of different things. Right? So the most common thing and the, mo the thing that we're mostly going to talk about today really is having vertices as molecules. Um, so <laughs> whether they're genes or proteins or RNAs, or sometimes we even talk about drug molecules as being part of the proteins in a graph. But there's a, there are a lot of other things you can represent here. right? We can represent diseases <laughs> as nodes. Um, I actually think it's really interesting when we start looking at individuals in a study as the nodes of a graph. right? So we have not been doing a lot with the growth of biomedical data that's coming out there. But imagine you could, you could come up with a graph that 
you know, has all the people who've ever posted on YouTube about their toddler's development, right? And, you know, a couple of quotes or characteristics that they have in common represent an edge. And then you might learn some really interesting things about, like, for example, if you did this with autism, you would have found out probably by looking at clusters in the graph and looking at keywords associated with them, you might have seen the association between autism and um, digestive disorders years before the doctors finally figured this out. All the parents knew, right? But the doctors didn't know that there was a connection there, right? So you can see connections like that by, figuring, by, by thinking of new ways to represent data in graphs. And sometimes we even have nodes that mean different things in the same graph, and I will talk about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> But the edges are, you know, in whatever it is you're doing, the edges are going to represent some kind of relationship between pairs of entities. And I want to kind of come back to this, right? So I'll just, you know, the kinds that we see most often in this field are protein-protein physical interactions where they actually bind to each other. Um, genetic interactions, they don't necessarily bind to each other, right? The definition, the classic definition of a genetic interaction is that you cannot predict the phenotype of mutating both proteins from the phenotypes of mutating either one, right? So classic example in yeast, you knock out this protein, yeast is fine. You knock out this protein, the yeast is fine. You knock them both out, it dies. Obviously hard to do this in humans and even inappropriate to do it on large scale in any kind of larger metal organisms. But you can predict these kinds of things. Um, we talked a lot about regulation yesterday, so you can represent regulatory networks tend to be represented with directed edges, because you're regulating the expression of another protein, so there's a direction to that. Signaling is the same kind of thing. There may be physical interactions. There may be intermediate molecules. Um, they're not necessarily represented in here, so there are some hidden nodes, potentially. Um, and we won't talk a lot about gene co-expression, but people do build graphs showing when genes are expressed in the same circumstances. Uh, we'll talk a little about that, right? So <laughs> maybe the big question here is when we want to represent systems, first of all, why are we talking about graphs? Um, <laughs> right, I mean, you know, things work in sets. Maybe we should be looking at other kinds of representations. And it isn't always clear that a graph is the right solution, right? But there are a subset of problems where we've found that binary interactions are sufficient to give us a lot of information. And so that, that kind of question is uh, the first thing you really need to be asking yourself is, you know, why am I doing this and do I need a graph? Is a graph the right thing? <coughs> Another important question I think we should look at is, you know, when we're doing the representation, right, we need to think a little about how we're representing it. So maybe I should just ask this question, right? Are biological networks sparse or dense networks, typically? And I'm generalizing broadly. Sparse. Sparse. Right, we probably don't have a protein interacting with all other proteins. We probably don't have a person who has, you know, a, something that we're characterizing in common with 80% of the other people out there. Because if we do, we probably don't want to see those edges in a graph anyway. Right? It's going to look unreadable. So <laughs> when I talk about graphs, right, we're probably representing things with edge lists. But we can think about it in terms of the matrix. And the reason for this is you may want to talk about spectral decomposition of the matrix or something else of that sort. It doesn't matter how we're representing it. You can still characterize things this way. Um, so I'll give a couple of examples of different kinds of <laughs> nodes and or representations where we have sort of heterogeneous graphs. Um, <laughs> this was actually a really interesting paper that I will come back to that looks at relationships between basically diseases and genes. <laughs> right? And you can build a graph showing edges between them. And you can infer from that a gene-gene graph that says we, we link two genes if they're if they have a disease in common or a disease-disease graph that goes the other way. Right? So you can find patterns in all of them by building something that's bipartite um, and identify relationships. Uh, Rodette is going to talk a little later about <laughs> this approach where all of the nodes in a bipartite graph are the same thing. They're proteins. But the edges are actually different. And um, there are different kinds of edges. And by finding groups of edges, you can actually predict genetic interactions between pairs of proteins just by looking at where you would expect to see a genetic interaction from, from the graph structure. Um, and you can even get information by having different thing, you know, different representations of different kinds of nodes in the same 
kind of graph without that kind of structure, right? So you might have a multipartite graph, you might not. This is an old paper of ours where we looked at correlation in gene expression across a set of cell lines with drug sensitivity across the same set of cell lines. And we just sort of built a co co-expression or sensitivity network. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the things that we were able to do was find subnets that had both genes and drugs in them and predict. So actually, this drug is known for working in, ca in cancers where that protein is highly expressed. And it was conjectured as well that that one, you know, these other ones that didn't really have any knowledge, nobody really knew what they were, would actually work. And they did some testing on that and pursuing it. So. Um, you can learn things from throwing things into a graph, even if they're kind of mixed together. And maybe the last question you want to think about a little bit is <laughs> how biological networks that you're working with are going to change, right? So you may actually want to be modeling evolution, or you may not want to model evolution. You may just want to figure out, <laughs> are these networks um, you know, changing during the course of the experiment in some, t is there some time temporal way that they might be doing, right? If you're looking at co-expression over time, for example. Um, and the, the bigger question about that is really this one, right? So I think mostly the protein interaction network, let's say, of an organism is not changing over time, but what's actually happening in that organism is, um, and the big question that we tend not to talk about, it's kind of the elephant in the room, uh, is what are we missing? Right? What don't we know about the graphs that we have? And so most of the graphs that we have in any biological system that I can think of, we know some of the nodes and some of the edges. And <laughs> the fact that we don't know them and that we have bias in what we're selecting is really crucial to understanding what's going on. So I will get back to a little of that. Um, right. So since I'm think, talking about the elephant in the room, I thought I'd have an elephant. Right, so this is the standard sort of, you can get different properties by looking at different parts of the graph, or different aspects of the graph, but you're not necessarily going to get a whole picture. So it's important if you're looking at specific network properties to bear in mind that there's a whole elephant out there um, <laughs> that you may not be seeing all of. Right, so one of the characteristics that we talk about a lot with in graph theory that we will use in biology is the degree distribution of a graph. Right, so it's pretty straightforward, <laughs> just a, a, in this case a histogram or a frequency histogram of the degrees of all the nodes. Um, you could do this with in and out degree. <laughs> and um, this can be used to characterize any kind of network. I, you know, we looked at social networks, web pages, um, I actually really like this one because um, the ISMB board of directors is somewhere out here, and I think we've been arguing that it ought to go that way, so I really like this picture that shows that most companies tend to go a little smaller. Um, <laughs> right, I can, I'm not going to say a lot. I mean, again, I'm not going to really define, or I'm, I'm putting up definitions of graph theory terms, but I think most people here are pretty familiar with them, so I'm not going to belabor that point. I'm going to talk more about their use in biology. Um, but I did want to just sort of get everybody on the same page about path lengths, right? So again, in an undirected graph, it's just is there a path of length of so many nodes? The path length is the number of edges. Um, and we can compute shortest paths using really your favorite shortest paths algorithm. Um. <coughs> And if we do that, we get, so the, the thing I wanted to say about network diameter, people do talk a lot about network diameters in biology. I have seen some papers out there that don't define it this way. Um, this is the standard definition, the longest, shortest path between any two nodes in the graph. There are people who define diameter as the average shortest path. Um, I, just be careful of that when you're reading papers in this field, but you need to know what they're actually talking about. Right, so the, the first sort of non-trivial property that I think is really interesting for <coughs> biological networks is probably the clustering coefficient. Um, for those of you who didn't live through the 80s, these are Brat Pack actors, and they have an edge between them if they did a movie together. And most of them did movies together, but not all of them. Um, <coughs> right, so this is sort of a measure of how, you know, are my friends connected to my other friends? And this is a common thing in social networks. We have lots of friends who are all connected to each other. Um, 
so formally you can define that, right? <laughs> the clustering coefficient is, is so do I have, are, are my two friends, are any two friends of mine connected to each other? Right here I am. And here are my two friends. So if they're connected and I, they're my friends, then there's a triangle, right? So we do this by triangle count. <laughs> So basically, how many? Tri if I want to know the clustering coefficient of this guy, I ask how many triangles there are that are connected to this guy, um, and I divide that by how many possible triangles there could be. Well, how many could there be? It's the number of ways of choosing all pairs of neighbors of the graph. So if I have degree of v neighbors, it's degree of v times degree of v minus one over two, <laughs> right? And so that's the clustering coefficient of a node, and then you can just average that over the whole graph to get the clustering coefficient of the graph. Right, so if I have a high clustering coefficient, I look like the Brad Pack, um, more or less. <laughs> so why do I care about clustering coefficient? Well, this turns out to have some correlation with protein function, right? And these are, these are often the case that we're, we're looking at examples of networks where if we have a protein-protein interaction network and, it has, and a particular node has a higher clustering coefficient, maybe that's going to say something about how it works. Right, so maybe the first thing I have to do is define the concept of essentiality, although we did talk a little about it earlier. Um, but an essential protein right, is one that's necessary for life. So traditionally, again, you, you demonstrate this by knocking it out and showing that you can't produce an organism. We don't do this in humans. So we learn this about essentiality. This is a slide about yeast. Um, <laughs> But we've, a lot of the papers that I've seen that talk about essential proteins in humans actually look at the knockout phenotypes in mice, right? And you can tell development. And often they're, they're proteins that are essential at some stage in development. So if you could knock down its function later in life when you have an adult mouse, it might be OK. But if you knock it out um, and, and create an embryo that way, it's not going to develop properly, right? So, Pretty much for you know the mouse genome database at this point has a categorization of phenotypes for an awful lot of perturbations of mouse genes. I won't say everything, but they're they're getting close to the point where you can look at almost everything. Um, and sometimes they do temperature sensitive mutants, so you can tell what happens you know when you disable the protein at a particular point. <laughs> so what we what they discovered is that. Clustering coefficient of a node is particularly correlated with a node's being an essential node, right? But, right. So this sort of makes sense. If all of my friends are connected to each other, I'm doing something that's pretty pretty well connected. <laughs> Maybe it's pretty important to life, and they're seeing that. Um, they actually were also looking at those proteins that were mediating the toxicity, of, you know, response to a toxic environment, and those actually were not quite as highly connected as the as the uh, essential proteins. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about the correlation between essentiality and degree? Right. I am going to comment at length about it. Okay, so that's a great question. Can I talk about essentiality and degree? And I'm, there's a whole thing on this, so yes. <laughs> essentiality and centrality. But basically, right, so there's this, um, well, let me do that. There's, there's a sort of centrality lethality hypothesis. So let me talk about centrality and then we'll go there. Um, okay, so what does it mean to be central in, in, in a network, right? Having a high clustering coefficient is kind of one approach to that, right? My, ne my neighbors are all really highly connected to each other, but there are a lot of ways of measuring how central you are. And centrality is some, in some ways a notion of importance. So again, it, it's kind of correlated with function. Um, right, the simplest thing you could do is talk about degree centrality, right? This is basically just a normalized version of the degree of the node. This didn't seem to me to be that exciting, but actually, you know, people do this. And, you know, for some things it works pretty well, right? This, this node has high degree centrality and these guys don't. On the other hand, for these other two graphs, there's something really important about the notion of what it means to be central in those graphs that is not captured by the degree, right? So in this bottom one, the three middle nodes all have the same degree centrality, but they're not all equally central in my view. And up there, you know, these guys are actually considered more central than this. So, well, it depends, right? They're more connected, but not really more central. Um, so one of the things that is sort of a good observation is degree centrality is not a great measure of kind of global properties, right? It's very local. 
Um, and so it may be good for measuring local properties of the area, but it's not a great way of saying, OK, I care about getting information from one side of the graph to the other, or how to communicate with pe people further away. Um, closeness centrality might get at that a little bit. <laughs> right? So if you just measure things by how far, you know, what's sort of the length, the shortest path to every other node, and then average that, <laughs> um, you'll get a better sense that the, the node in the middle is really more central. And so sometimes people will look at closeness centrality of nodes in maybe a protein network or a patient network. Um, related to the clustering coefficient, we have things like eigenvector centrality. <laughs> right, so again, it's sort of, if my, this is like a variant on page rank, right? If my neighbors are highly ranked or they have a lot of edges coming into them, then, then I'm more important. And that's sort of another way of measuring that. Um, this one is kind of good, <laughs> right? Because it's it's saying this node is really more important, even you know because I have a lot of neighbors that are also highly connected. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> that is some I've sometimes seen that used, but the most commonly used one that I've seen is actually betweenness, and that's really looking at information flow. So that's a global property of the network. Um, and it is looking specifically at, for all pairs of shortest paths in the network, <coughs> what fraction of those shortest paths go through a particular node, right? So this gets at this concept. If you're looking at a network is really some way of modeling how information moves from one point to another, that's exactly getting at this. Is the, the, something with high betweenness is going to have um, a lot of paths passing through it. And just to compare that with like a degree centrality picture, right, you can, uh, I've colored these. These guys have the same, you can't, can you see them? These guys have the same betweenness centrality, but they have different degrees. But that actually makes sense because in terms of conducting information between different nodes of the graph, they're actually no different from each other. Right? It doesn't matter that some of these have you know, one node coming into them and some of them have two. They're still not on a path from anything to anything else. Right? And so that's really capturing the information flow more effectively. Um, right? So we can define that officially. <coughs> Again, I'm not going to talk a lot about algorithms here because you can basically use Floyd Warshall or any, any of your favorite uh, algorithms, and because in this particular case, most of the graphs we're doing this on are protein interaction graphs where the number of nodes is tens of thousands and the number of edges is not hugely bigger, maybe it's hundreds of thousands, it's not huge, right? And so the running time of the algorithm is actually less of an issue than the time it takes to implement it, right, or something of that ilk, or the run leading constant. So it's really not worth it to try to say, okay, I can get my V cubed algorithm down to, I don't know, what is it, V to the 2.8 or something by doing something really clever and sophisticated that's going to take me three weeks to program. Um, that may change when we talk about other problems, right? So in this particular case, again, I'm leaning away from algorithms because because the standard ones are fine. Um, right, so again, we can compute the number of shortest paths. Why do we care about betweenness? Why do we care about centrality? Right, again, this is correlated very heavily with properties of nodes in the network. And so maybe the classic example is some work out of Mark Gerstein's lab that talks about network bottlenecks. <laughs> Basically, bottlenecks are nodes with high centrality. Some of them also have high degree. Some of them do not have high degree. There's a bottleneck that's not a very high degree, right? And this might be a bottleneck that is. Um, but one of the things that he noticed was that it mattered whether you were talking about information flow or not, right? So in the regulatory network, the bottlenecks were much more likely to be essential molecules. In the protein interaction network, he didn't find that as clearly in this data set. Right? The bottlenecks were not as likely to be, or not any more likely to be essential molecules. Right? And so this is starting to get the question you were talking about, about centrality and essentiality. Um, right, so there is, there is a centrality-lethality hypothesis that says the more central you are in the network, uh, 
the more likely you are to be an essential protein. Um, this is a subject of some debate. <laughs> and I will talk about where, I'm not even sure where those slides are, but um, <laughs> I'm getting to, at some point today, where we believe that and where we don't believe that and why it's not always true in all the data. But I think this is starting to get at some of the reasoning behind it. Protein-protein interaction networks are actually modeling a couple of different things. Right? <laughs> they're modeling groups of proteins that work together to form a complex and do something. And they're modeling proteins that individually interact with each other under certain conditions to pass a signal along. Right? So they're doing information flow and non-information flow. <laughs> And if you have something here that's saying, well, actually, the information flow is what's making these bottlenecks be essential, right? So, so when they're important for that sort of signaling, they're really crucial. <laughs> when they're parts of complexes, they may be essential, they may not be. Um, we're muddying the data too much. We're mixing together a bunch of different things. And you know, we, we don't see this kind of effect necessarily in the interaction network. And therefore, we also don't see it as strongly in some of the larger PPI data sets. And we will again, I'm going to talk more about PPI data sets later on. Does that make some sense? Cool. All right, so <laughs> right. So the other thing is, what about disease genes, right? Are disease genes more central or not? And it seems like that would make some kind of sense, that if genes are more essential for life than when you disrupt them, you know, bad things happen. Um, so even if you don't need them, maybe if they're not essential for early development, maybe if you disrupt them, then you know you get <laughs> later you get some some negative effects corresponding to disease. Right. So <laughs> it turns out that what what these guys found, um, I think this is out of Mark Vidal's lab also, is that. Uh, the essential protein, so there were a certain number of essential complexes. But aside from that, most of the disease genes were actually hubs in the protein interaction network. I'm sorry, were not hubs in the protein interaction network. They were peripheral. Right, so why is that? <laughs> well, actually, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense with respect to evolution, right? So if you have something that has a deleterious effect early in life, it's not going, you know, and it's not going to make it, right? It's going to get weeded out of the system if that happens, right? So if you have a disease gene, you're going to lose mutations in it. You're not going to have that disease process maintained in the population. <coughs> but if it's peripheral, then maybe you can get away with having it maintained in the population. And the corollary of this was that if that's the case, then disease, then uh, gene-related diseases from that arise from mutations that happen after you reproduce, more or less, <laughs> would not look like this, right? They would be more central. And in fact, that's exactly what they found when they look at cancer mutations in particular, right? Which, uh, yes, children get cancer, but by and large, these hit you later. They're not germline mutations. If you look at somatic mutations, they tend to be the central ones. So when you look at the whole graph of disease genes, there's a front chunk of them that are central, but those are disproportionately involved in things like cancer that, that affect not the germline, but specific cells at some point in the process. So <laughs> this centrality issue is really important to figuring out what, what genes might be involved in disease. And I, I don't really see the, the difference between disease gene and essential gene. I mean, I, I, there might be a big intersection, right? Between the difference between disease gene and essential gene, right. So <laughs> what they are talking about, right, so it, are all disease genes essential? So basically, no. <laughs> right, this is kind of what this is saying, is that, I mean, well, but the, the problem is if the disease is lethal, then we don't see it, right, in some sense. It's not lethal f 40 years later, right? It's le so that's the distinction we're making, is, is, it, is it lethal early on or is it lethal after you've, I mean, from evolution's point of view, all we care about is have you reproduced, right? Kind of like somebody's grandmother, right? If, you know, have you have you reproduced or not? And so, evolution is going to be looking at that and saying, well, this is you know, if if you're dead, then it doesn't get, it doesn't get maintained in the gene pool, right? So that mutation is not. Go so it may be a gene that causes a disorder, but if it's lethal at, at an early stage, we won't know about it. Um, 
right? We don't really characterize as diseases those things that cause miscarriages. We just say that that pregnancy didn't work. Um, <laughs> Right. So we tend to talk about disease genes as things where we, we can correlate them with diseases during the normal lifespan. And with the exception of cancer, these tend are, are less likely to be essential <coughs> and less likely to be central. So I think at this point I want to start talking a little about random graph models. Right, and again, I think random graph models are important here because if we can match some of the graphs that we see to random graph models, we can start to think about how they evolved or how they developed um, and why they developed that way. Right, so the most general random graph model that people talk about is the Erdős-Rényi model, and I'm actually going to talk, I'm mentioning their, the first model they proposed, which is not the one that everybody reasons about first. Right? So there are two models that are actually attributed to them, where you have a set of n vertices in them. And the first one is just that all possible graphs with k edges on those n vertices are, are sort of thrown into a pool, and you pick one at random with equal probability. Right? So this was actually the first model attributed to them, but the one that everybody talks about because it's easier to reason about was also proposed by them, but it was also proposed by Gilbert. Um, and I got <laughs> kind of yelled at by a colleague of mine for calling this the Otis Remney model, so I'm, I'm just being clear about that. Um, <laughs> right, so in this case, we, it's kind of like the other one, except that we have, we have a set of n nodes and we have some particular probability, and we choose each node, or sorry, each edge with the probability p between a pair of nodes. <laughs> so the difference between these two models is that the first model has exactly k edges, and the second model has, on average, k edges, but it has some distribution, right? So you could have a graph with no edges here. You could have a graph with, that's complete. Unlikely, but if n is of any size at all, but it's possible. Um, <laughs> And the erdos renyi model is pretty, right, so it's sometimes represented as G of N and P, um, right, so the expected number of edges is the number of possible edges times the probability, and the expected degree follows if you just assume that each edge has two endpoints. Um, so what do we want to say about erdos renyi Let's see how much time I've got. Right. One of the important things about them is that you get a series of phase transitions in the graphs as you grow it. So basically, if you think about it, when, when you have a very large n, um, when you have a really small probability, you're not going to have any edges at all. Right? If it's substantially less than 1 over n squared, you're not going to get any edges. <laughs> if it's substantially greater than 1 over n squared, you expect to see some edges. Right, so there's a point at an inflection point at, or a phase transition at one over n squared where you get, you know, go from not having edges to having edges, and there are similar transition points for all, sort of large, all sorts of connectivity properties. Right, so you can get, you know, a component of size greater than two, uh, triangles, <laughs> um, spanning trees, and so on. Right, so when you simulate this, you can see how you kind of, this is like a phase transition on a graph with 50 nodes. Um, <laughs> when P is small, you just get maybe a few edges and one component that's larger than two. Right, when it gets a little bigger, you start to see cycles and a decent sized component that's you know, bigger than log n. Um, when you get a little bigger, you get what's called a giant component, where most of the nodes are collected and connected in. And it takes a while to actually get to the point where every node is connected. Right? So there are these sort of phase transition points in the random graph model. Uh, what do I want to say about this? The other property that people sometimes look at is the degree distribution of the random graph model. So this is basically a binomial distribution. <laughs> it's on the edges, right? the probability of choosing uh, an edge, so basically if you, you have 
know, the probability of having a, a node of degree v, d is exactly the number of possible nodes that you could choose, ways you could choose d edges out of a node. So actually, there's a, this should really be n minus 1, but it depend, unless you're allowing self-loops. So I've seen both formulations represented. Um, <laughs> and then the probability of having those d edges and not having the other edges. Right, so this is binomial. It's actually um, close to Poisson. If n is large, you can approximate it by the Poisson distribution. So these are sometimes called Poisson random graphs. Right, so the big question that we run into is, are biological networks like this? <coughs> um, and some maybe. Right, you can look at a number of the properties we've discussed of these graphs and try to say, do they look more like this or not. <laughs> but a lot of biological networks and a lot of natural networks of all kinds <laughs> um, don't look like this. And many of them have this sort of power law distribution where when you look at it on a log-log plot, you get more or less a straight line. Um, something approximating that, right? So these are also called scale-free graphs where the probability is proportional to, of having something of degree k is proportional to k to the negative alpha for some alpha. Um, often alpha is between 2 and 3 for a lot of natural networks for some reason. Uh, right, and so we see this for many kinds of biological graphs. <laughs> One of the important things about these kind of graphs um, is looking at fault tolerance properties, right? So in this, so this is sort of an example on the right here. We have a, a random graph model of network of distribution across the uh, the U.S. <laughs> maybe maybe the interstate highway network looks a little more like this, right? And it's a system where. <laughs> um, you know, if you if you knock out a particular, you know, an arbitrary node, it's more likely to have sort of average connectivity. So you're going to do a reasonable amount of damage. <laughs> but if you, you know, so it's, but there aren't any particular nodes where you could say, well, I'm going to do the, the, you know, a huge amount of damage, so I'm going to get that one. Um, in something with a power law distribution, you get the emergence of what are called hubs, right? Nodes of high degree. And if you have hubs, that are particularly high degree and most nodes have particularly low degree, then you're really robust to random failures, but you're particularly able to handle, uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're not particularly able to handle malicious attacks. <laughs> right, so if I want to do damage, I'm going to knock this guy out. <laughs> but, you know, and this is the way the web works, right? By and large, random failures don't, you know, nobody notices them because by and large they affect some relatively not very connected part of the web. Um, if a major hub goes down, that's a problem, but it's unlikely to happen at random. It's going to take a concerted attack. Right, so again, we care about this somewhat in the concept of, of um, bio biological networks. So again, most protein interaction networks certainly do look hubby, right? They look more like power law graphs, sort of. Um, <laughs> they definitely have a number of hubs. And this talks about evolution as well, right? So the hubs tend to evolve a lot of connections and stay that way. Um, hub net nodes tend to be have been shown to be older evolutionarily, <laughs> right? And because and, and in addition, they are more essential proteins, <laughs> right? So the hub nodes tend to be considered essential. This vulnerability to random attack can be used for a bunch of ways. So um, this is actually some <laughs> stuff looking at protein interactions between host proteins and viruses, <laughs> right? If you have a viral <laughs> So viruses don't have a lot of genes of their own or a lot of proteins of their own. And so they tend to work by co-opting proteins from the host. Right? So you get viral proteins that interact with host proteins in order to infect the host and reproduce the virus, which is its goal. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what happens is that viral proteins can survive, right? So, so this is actually the kind of situation where you have a malicious attack in the sense that the host organism is trying to evolve a way that the virus protein can't interact with it. Right, so the host is trying to break that down, and the virus is trying to maintain it. So what tends to happen is one of two things. Either you get the virus interacting with very highly connected host proteins, where it's hard to get rid of this, because if you change that one protein, you're going to have to change you know, or affect a, a large, highly connected network. Or it affects, interacts with a large number of not so connected proteins, and so again, <laughs> You could change one of them, but in order to break this, you're going to have to change a whole lot of things. <laughs> right? So this is so, the sort of thing you can learn about evolutions. And you can use things like this to try to predict protein-protein interactions with, between viruses and hosts. And therefore, ideally design drugs that interfere with it or something of that, that ilk. So there are real corollaries to some of these properties. So which of the two is more uh... Which of the two is more? So actually, both of those tend to happen. <laughs> um, and again, we, we, this is just uh, data that looked at HIV. Right? So getting, getting data for protein and, or uh, viral, virus host interactions um, on, a, on a comprehensive enough scale to do this is, I mean, actually, this is older, older results. There might be more data now on this, but it was not something that was done that systematically for that many viruses. Um, but HIV, they'd pretty well characterize the interactions of. Um, and it really does both. So it depends on the viral protein. There were some that do this and there's some that do that. But they tend to, if they're interacting with the host, that's what they're doing. And that's how they evade, I guess, being disrupted um, and what makes it hard to treat them. So. So the last couple of models I wanted to talk about um, are <laughs> models that are more like social network models, right? They're sort of small world models where <laughs> the idea, th these basically try to capture some of the properties that you have in biological, I'm sorry, in naturally occurring networks. Not just biological, but you know, social networks or web networks or something. So. <laughs> Basically, the idea is things have high clustering coefficient, or what I said called here is transitive friends, right? My friends' friends are my friends. Um, but that's pretty common in social networks. But when you look at your Facebook graph, you don't just have a, a near clique of friends. You also have links to random people you know a little bit. What would they call weak ties, right? You know somebody through work. You know somebody through, I don't know. Your, the trip you took last week with a group of people from after, after at the lab, you met somebody's spouse or something, and you connected to them. <laughs> um, so you have these weak ties. And the good thing about these weak ties is that they tend to connect to random other parts of the network. And so they make the diameter much lower. <laughs> so the diameter of small world networks is thought to be you know, typically on the order of log n, where you have n nodes. Whereas a graph with high, just high clustering coefficient, the diameter could be order n or something of that ilk. Right. So it's not just these small high clustering coefficient, but weak ties that make this work. So an example of that is to do something. They had this sort of nice um, lat ring lattice model where you simulate this. But let's say you connect to every node in, of a group of n nodes to all of its <coughs> neighbors of distance k along the, along the graph. Right? And then with some probability, you're going to rewire some of those edges. So with, every, with probability p, each edge gets moved. Right, You have a node that does this. And instead, you break that node, and you move it over here. Right? So here we have an example of something where you have high clustering coefficients, but also these weak ties to random parts of the network that connect things very well. And so it can be shown that when you do this at some reasonable size, you get very nice small world properties. Right? You get these high clustering coefficients, but small diameters on most such random networks. 
right? And so this is, again, good for, well, there are some papers that argue that, in general, this is a good way to support complex systems. Um, but particularly, it's good at making sure that you can communicate effectively with distant parts of the network while functioning in a coherent way on a local scale. Right? So it's a property that deals with both local and global properties. Um, and a really nice example of this that isn't protein-protein interaction networks was actually modeling neural connections as a network. Right? And so these folks did uh, some work on the neural connections of a couple of different model organisms. Uh, and we're able to demonstrate that, you know, their small world the simulations did a nice job of connecting things in the way that neural networks ought to be connected, and the real ones looked very much like it. So the actual connectivity map between neurons um, was ha sort of had this small world property, right? You could see how that could be useful for building a functioning brain. Right? You want to be able to, to fan out the signal very quickly when you need to, but many decisions get made locally. So, the growth of this <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going backwards. There we go. <laughs> right, so a lot of, th so the, the, one of the questions is how do scale-free networks arise, right? And they arise through some sort of growth process that, I mean, again, you can kind of simulate this at random, but you're getting increasing numbers of both nodes and edges, and you're getting what they call preferential attachment. Basically, if you have high degree, you're more likely to have more edges coming into you. So hubs become hubbier, if I can use that terminology. Um, <laughs> Right, and Barabashi and Alberts actually showed through some simulation that this preferential attachment thing is what makes networks have a scale-free kind of distribution. Right, so that's essential. You get this a lot in nature. It's basically saying that you make local decisions and you get this kind of global structure. Right, so I'm just going to decide who to, you know, I'm going to decide where to point my web page to. Do I want to point it towards, you know, respected sources that have a lot of links already, or do I want to point it to, you know, my kid's best friend? Right? Well, probably, I mean, maybe I'll do a little of that, but mostly I'm going to go towards something that, that's going to increase my respect by pointing to highly connected nodes. So this is the same kind of thing, right? It's a, I'm making local decisions. Everybody's making local decisions, but we get as an, the emergence of this big global property from it. Um, and so there's a question about whether you get this in biological network evolution as well. <laughs> right? how, do, how do networks evolve? Right? They grow. But they tend to grow often by duplication and then change, right? So, so I mean, either you get mutation that's kind of gradual, or you get duplication of something and it then diverges. <coughs> um, so it's not always clear that you get this kind. I mean, you get a certain kind of preferential attachment where you have something that, if it's high degree, it's going to continue to be high degree. But it's it's. Sort of debatable, and the growth model is definitely a little bit different from what tends to affect sorry, um, power law graphs that are randomly simulated power law graphs. <laughs> right, and so this is, again, of some debate. The last, I just have a couple of minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit more about local structure and local models. Um, so some of the, some interest has arisen from characterizing individual network motifs in local graphs. So you can look at small substructures of any set of two or three or five nodes and try to characterize the shape of that. Um, if you do this, you can either find functions associated with those particular shapes, or you can actually characterize the whole graph globally, again, by these local properties. And one of the pieces of that uh, that What's kind of interesting is this last random graph model, which is called a geometric random graph model, where basically you pick a number of points in space uniformly at random in some metric space, and then there's an edge between every pair of points that are within some radius r. Right. So one of the things you'll notice about this very quickly, this is just a simulation I threw together in r a few days ago, um, is that you get you know, high clustering coefficients, which you'd expect, right? You're connected very tightly to your neighbors by definition. Um, but you don't have these weak ties, 
So the diameter of such networks, you know, the, to get from here to here is actually a pretty long path. <laughs> right, so these, I think, in some ways resemble some of the local structure of biological networks. In other ways, they may not. Um, <laughs> There are some results arguing that the, the graphlet distribution of these kinds of graphs is more similar to those of protein-protein interaction networks that have been observed than other things. But I think they may also be lacking. You know, if you look at other other properties like the diameter, I think they're going to be a little bit off. Um, <coughs> so whether these things emerge, you know, this is this is another way of thinking about evolution of connections of sort of looking at mutate. Maybe this is more of a model of of individual mutation rather than duplication. So maybe the real thing is some combination of the two. <laughs> um, actually, it'd be interesting to look at weighted versions of the combinations of the two and see if you do a better version of capturing the, the global network properties. So that's an open problem if somebody wants to play around with it. So the, the points of random in, in, in some metric, yeah, so in some metric space. So actually, it's a good question. Um, they tried two, three, and four dimensional metric spaces, and three was, in fact, what worked best. But it's um, within a cube. So it's within a unit cube, yeah. There's some definition. Right, so, but, but the local stru structure, you know, the distribution of, of <laughs> things that look like that and things that look like this was similar to what was actually observed. With the big caveat that what we're actually observing is this subset of data, right? So now we're talking about protein interaction networks, and I'm going to talk about that again in about an hour. But the, the subset of data that we're getting is noisy in ways that we really need to characterize this. So I should actually just end maybe with an anecdote, which is that I came into this field of computational biology through machine learning. And I was working with Ron Rivest on machine learning from noisy data. And we had all these great theoretical models of machine learning and noise and what kinds of noise we could have and you know, very engineering-y models with probabilities and good distributions. And then I stumbled into the Human Genome Project. And I thought it was a great source of noisy data, which um, they get really huffy when you say that. But in fact, it's true. Uh, and all of our noise models were completely wrong, right? We simulate this stuff poorly. <laughs> we continue to simulate it poorly because it's real life and it doesn't follow nice, pretty engineering models of noise, except in simple cases like if we're looking at, at transmission errors or something, right, or storage errors. But the noise that we're actually experiencing is, is you know, a living thing. And so <laughs> um, the actual models <laughs> don't always fit your expectations. And so we really need to, characterizing and understanding the source of the noise is really important. And I think we will talk about that later. And for now, I'll just say that we are being controlled by the random outcomes of a complex system. I think they, they nailed it. <laughs> Questions? So about this uh, geometric problem, yeah. So what, when you're saying that this is uh, representing the, the graphlets uh, that one observes in reality better, better than what? Um, <coughs> better than power law random models or <laughs> small watts struggats kind of random models? It's That's a good question, right? I mean, this is <laughs> one person's perspective it's not necessarily mine but um, but there are you know they had some interesting I, I think what's interesting about it and the reason I'm talking about it is that there are some interesting local properties that emerge from that sort of style and so maybe maybe I actually think that the real thing you know what actually happened was some combination of, of duplication and, and mutation um, and therefore it could be represented by something that has some probability of looking like a random, uh, like a small world model and some probability of looking like a geometric model. But what's the biological condition for the geometric model? Uh, I actually don't have good, well, I, I mean, again, local connections are probably mutations, right? So. I'm connected to my neighbors, so if I duplicate and, and mutate a little bit or just mutate something, 
I'm going to change and connect to neighbors in a little, a little bit of a neighboring way. Right? Or so, you know, not a very distant way. I'm not going to make these. No, it's not necessarily clear, right? It's possible that a small mutation makes a huge conformational shift, and then, and then you do something totally different. Um, so that's, you could argue that point. Uh, but I guess that's what the model is, yeah. Distance is in three dimensional, three dimensional. Yeah. So this is this, so this was actually a three dimensional, or their, their results were three dimensional. The simulation was not. It's the space. It's the space of 3D, and there's a distance, yeah, Euclidean distance. If we define the distance as like a, a biological interaction, I mean, the distance has influence, biological influence. Like let's say if one gene inhibits. Uh, does it's really close to another gene? Then is it more relevant geometrically? Maybe. <laughs> right. So sometimes genes and proteins can compensate for each other, and sometimes they don't. Right. And <laughs> I mean, is it more relevant? You know, they, the one you interact with is usually often there's a region that's complementary to yours, but it's not necessarily identical to you. Um, but within, with some, within reason, right? So when you have gene duplication events um, within a species, there may be some propensity for interaction. But often, you know, they're, often they share their partners more until they diverge sufficiently. That's a good question. So. I haven't really followed in detail this uh, uh, this uh, power law models, but for a while it looked like everything can be represented by right. So, so actually, in the protein-protein interaction talk later, I'm, I have I, I, that's where I have the slide on this. But a lot of things look like they have power law models. Um, <laughs> this, you know, protein interaction networks, there's a debate on this, right? Some, of, some things look very much, some data sets look very much like that and are a good fit to that, and some aren't. And then there are all sorts of explanations as to why. So we can take that offline for now, but I will come back to it. Other questions? Okay, I'm standing between you guys and coffee, so I think I should let you get coffee. <laughs>